The Indianapolis Colts have yet to address the cornerback position this offseason, but that could all change if the Colts decide to draft Toledo cornerback Quinion Mitchell. Would Mitchell solve the concerns about the Colts at cornerback? And how does the re-signing of Julian Blackman change things in the secondary? Let's talk about it. Welcome to the Horseshoe Huddle podcast presented by Fan Nation on SI.com, part of the Fans First Sports Network. My name is Andrew Moore, and as always, I'm joined here by my fellow writer and analyst at Horseshoe Huddle, Drake Wally. Drake, we're switching to the defensive side of the football for our prospect breakdowns tonight, and none other than a guy that very well could be the starting cornerback for the Indianapolis Colts next season and Quinion Mitchell. Uh, as we dive into his game tonight there's going to be a lot of things to to like if you're a Colts fan and and he ends up being the pick uh, uh on December or I'm sorry December on April 25th yeah if the Colts are drafting in December they did something really wrong <laughs> all right and the NFL did something wrong by not telling them um but no man I I'm I'm so pumped to talk about Quinion Mitchell I think that there's a lot to love here and there's little there's little to not like. That's the good news. He's a very complete player. We're going to get into what, what impresses us. You know, we'll do the, the strengths and the weaknesses. But ultimately, will he become a Colt? How does he fit this scheme? I'm excited to talk about it also because you were literally there at the Toledo Pro Day. Yeah, and even though Quinion Mitchell didn't work out at the, the Toledo Pro Day, we were able to, to gain some insight into into what makes him tick, uh, so the interest that the Colts have shown, which which might surprise a little bit uh, uh, some some people as we get into it, but but honestly, looking at, at Quinion Mitchell, I mean, he has a case, and 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 not just a case, but he is some teams cornerback one in this draft class, and and for the Indianapolis Colts, you know. Uh, they they after re-signing Julian Blackman, which we'll we'll talk about tonight as well. There's really not a lot of cap space to make any more moves. I think right now the Colts are sitting with just under ten million dollars in cap space. That this might be it, you know. So you, who knows if they're going to sign uh, an out of outside free agent to bring in? At this point, I would have to say no as far as the cornerback position is concerned. Shout out to Sean Conkright getting us off to, to a hot start in the chat. What's up to you? Stats hey, Matt in the chat as well. What's up? Ready, ready for you to debut my new segment. So, yes, we do have a new segment. I haven't even told Drake about this, but I hit up Stats Matt. Guys, we're going to start out a stats mat stat of the day. It's going to be, it's just going to happen randomly within the show. But we're good. But we, you know, listen, we always say that stats mat's the third host of the show. Might as well give him a segment the stats mat stats of the day. Uh, so that's, that's going to uh, pop in here uh, at some point tonight. Thank you so much, stats mat. As always, Sean Cartwright also saying I could see us selecting Mitchell and possibly moving up from round two back into the first for worthy. That'd be interesting. Uh, Patrick, didn't I just watch you clowns for 30 minutes? Guess we can keep rolling. So yes, we did just do a crossover episode with uh, Jake Arthur and our buddy Shad McGinnis on locked on Colts. Make sure you <laughs> Go check that out after you uh, are join us here tonight. Yim, uh, thank you so much for the super chat, Yim. Good evening, fellas. Thanks as always for the show. Well, thank you for all of your support. And we've got Noah in the chat. Uh, and Noah said, I wish I had 10 million left. Yeah, same brother. Uh, I wish I had 10 million dollars. That'd be a left. good problem to have. Exactly. Definitely would. So, as everyone joins in the chat, make sure you go follow us on all of our socials like Horseshoe Huddle on Facebook, follow at Colts on FN on X and subscribe to the Horseshoe Huddle YouTube channel. Hit that bell so you know when Drake and I go live every Monday and Thursday night or for special breaking news episodes so you never miss us. But if you can't catch us on YouTube, no worries. Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever you listen to podcasts, we're on there as well. So make sure you subscribe. Give us a five-star review so we can reach other Colts fans just like you and Drake. Let's dive right into it, buddy. Toledo cornerback Quinion Mitchell could fill the Colts' biggest need this offseason. So, like I said, cornerback one on, on some teams' boards, some draft experts they feel like Quinion Mitchell is the top cornerback in this in this draft class. And honestly, he certainly fits the bill. You know, coming out of Toledo, you think it's a smaller school, so he really hasn't uh, uh, shown a uh, uh, the capability to play up against tougher competition. Well, he went to the senior bowl and was easily the best cornerback at the senior bowl dominated the combine. And we'll get into his RAS score as well. 
plot uh, uh just spoiler alert the Colts are really gonna like it but but Drake when you look at Quinion Mitchell's game all around I mean this guy just looks the part of a lockdown quarterback in the NFL well yeah and you know in our uh, speaking of that crossover crossover episode we kind of talked about this all around skill you know he's he's got the physicality he's got the size okay he's not like freakishly long like uh like juju brents who's almost six foot four but the guy plays like it i mean you got to think kenny moore he's like five foot nine but has ridiculously long arms and those traits help him in short coverage it helps him really get physical with some of these bigger receivers um quinion can play man all right he can keep up with anybody he runs like a 4.340 yard dash or something in that range he's very quick and then he can also play zone, which is what Gus Bradley loves. But you're also going to play plenty of press man, uh, you know, with with Gus Bradley. And he likes those big physical guys that have a lot of athletic traits, just like Chris Ballard does. So I think that I think that it's going to be really fun to dive into this guy, man, because he he really fits everything the Colts need to do defensively. He can potentially be an explosive player. And he showed a lot at Toledo. I know that they were in, I think, Conference USA. But don't let that discount you because a lot of times the NFL scouts are looking for players that just destroy the rest of the competition in college. And sometimes they turn out to be some of the best guys in the NFL. So just because he didn't have all the elite competition some of these other guys had, do not get it twisted. He's damn near, if not the number one cornerback right now in the rankings. Yeah, and, and Toledo's in the max. So, but but same same. Oh thing, my bad. You know, l- lower low level comp- competition. But Drake, when he went up against Marvin Harrison Jr. a couple seasons ago, I mean. Mitchell held his own. So that's yeah. that's a good omen for tonight. Shout out to David. David saying best Colts show. Let's go, Colts. Drake, you got the cup. Oh, yeah. Drake's got the cup. So it's on speed dial. Uh, By yeah. speed dial, I mean it's right here. It's literally just right here, man. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So so Drake, first thing we're gonna do, let's take a look at this kid's Raz, you know, and it's gonna be music to the Colts ears. A 9.80 Raz for Quinion Mitchell, uh measuring it at just over six foot, 195 pounds. But look at that bench press, guys. 20 reps on the bench press for a guy that's 195 pounds that bench press is 225 pounds so quinion mitchell uh not the tallest cornerback or the biggest cornerback by any means because you look at his arm length drake the only 31 inches but that guy's strong to just rep 225 pounds at that size uh that that tells me that that quinion mitchell is, is a physical corner and he's not afraid to mix it up with with bigger and more physical wide receivers yeah and you know uh something that's interesting i know that we all talk about raz score and everything but something that, that kind of reflects how well he tested with this is his nfl combine profile if you look it's got it's got what's called next gen stats score breakdown so they've got production score on a scale of one to 100 the same with athleticism score and then total score so this guy was 83 production score third among all cornerbacks in the draft 86 athleticism scores fourth among all cornerbacks in the draft and overall he was first among all cornerbacks in the draft now that's based off of combine and next gen stats this dude's an athletic freak is what we're saying and the fact that it's just not often you see with with kentley platt's uh ras system a, a green mark for for bench press for a cornerback right that is that's a 9.56 that means it's just a smidge under perfection as far as that ranking goes and that system goes. So you're talking about a guy who not only has all-around skill, Andrew, he also has ridiculous strength, which in that press coverage, man, I'm telling you, that could give a lot of guys issues. It, it really could. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then when you look at the at the explosion grade, uh, only good, but look at that vertical, Drake, 38-inch vertical. So nothing nothing to, to really complain about there. Quinion Mitchell can certainly get up and compete uh, for those jump balls. But obviously, the thing that really stands out outside of that bench press mark, Drake, is the speed. Four three three forty. Uh, the the one five four ten yard split. The two five three twenty yard split. It seems like the he just gets faster the longer it goes. And and if you if you really think about the Colts cornerback situation, you know, you you Juju Brents, Kenny Moore, Jalen Jones. None of those guys are really considered burners at, at no. cornerback. None of those guys can really stick with the fa- I would say for the fastest wide receivers in the NFL one on one in a track meet. Quinion Mitchell can't, you know, that four three three speed. Uh, and, and I kind of talked about this on Locked On Colts earlier, but I'll say it again here. You know, uh, the 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 play that really stuck sticks out to me is still is from Week 18 when Nico Collins 
was on that first first or second play from scrimmage where he just went on a deep ball and Stroud put it out there to him and and Collins ran away from the Colts defense you know the Colts don't have a a a, a cornerback on their roster that has that game breaking speed that can really stick with those wide receivers Mitchell would easily be that guy yeah, and that's something that's one of the knocks on Juju Brents is that if it is a foot race, it's over. And regardless of if I, I can't remember if the specific was that Cross had to pick up Dalton Schultz on an underneath route or whatever. But regardless, you got to think of it this way. If Cross screwed up, well, yeah, it, it doesn't help. But Brent still has to. It's the NFL. You still have to compensate for that. But if he did with his job, then that's on Brents even more so. So I think that you really got to get yourself a speedy corner. And something that's interesting is I was looking at his PFF score. So um, you're talking about a guy that had 781 total defensive snaps in 2023. 340 were run snaps. This dude posted a rock solid 76.1 run defense score. This dude sticks his nose in the backfield is my point. He can literally do everything. And if you look at CBS's NFL draft prospect rankings right now, I'm pretty sure when I first pulled these up at the start of all this, Quinion Mitchell wasn't ninth overall and number one cornerback overall. He has literally skyrocketed. I think Shot actually mentioned this in our crossover episode. Perhaps more than any other prospect in this entire draft cycle, this dude has literally just skyrocketed all the way into the potential top 15, top 20 range of the draft. Stats Matt saying, don't be taking my stats, Drake. So he's he's got some cooked in the chamber there for us for the, the Stats Matt stat of the day. I didn't know about <laughs> this until now, but I fully approve. It would have wasted time even asking me. I would have said yes. <laughs> Rhetorical. It's so, this is, this is going to be fun. A shout out to Yim. Another <laughs> super chat. Thank you so much, buddy, for all of your support. And and Yim has some uh, uh, some reservations about Quinion Mitchell. Yim says, obviously not an expert, but his tackling looks mid maybe i'm missing something i've been higher on arnold but i think mitchell fits the ballard mold more so uh this is this is a good a good point and we'll, we'll talk about his dive real into his strengths and weaknesses in a little bit but as far as tackling is concerned with quinion mitchell uh, when you when you look at tape from from previous years i definitely think that's something that, that he could work on but when you watch this tape from his senior season he has put a lot of work into his tackling at the cornerback position and, 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 and he's made it one of his strengths in my opinion. Uh, I, I don't think that it's, it's, he's necessarily going to win any awards for as the best tackling cornerback, but he's, he's worked on it enough that, that I don't have very made any major concerns, uh, about his tackling. Uh, he's a very willing tackler. It's not like he shies away from contact or or doesn't want to get involved in the run game. Quinion Mitchell will will definitely get get down and dirty and, and get in there and and tack and try to take down a running back with the best of them. Is he an elite tackler at the cornerback position? No. Is it bad enough that I think it's going to hurt his draft stock and and is a major red flag? I don't think so. Yeah. And, you know, when you talk about his missed tackles, if you look at the whole depth chart and how they performed, I think the team lead for Toledo was 15. Quinion had three. Now, this is based off of PFF, but um, there's not many other out there that, that talk about missed tackle metrics. So he did lead defensive backs, cornerbacks in missed tackles. But you also have to think he led the team in tackles still. And he also still did get in the backfield and make some big plays in the run game. So like Andrew said, I think that that's just something you can work out. You know, I, I really do. And I, I Ron Milas is one of the best in the business. And then I'm already spacing. Is it Justin Hamilton that came from the Titans? Yes. Okay. So he, he is a great young mind as the, the assistant with Ron Milas. So I think if there's tackle issues, I think that they're going to absolutely edge those out. The guy's got enough athleticism that that shouldn't be an issue long term, man. Yeah, and a lot of a lot of tackling at the cornerback position is is just effort. spotty. So yeah. I, I I think that I think that <laughs> yeah. he he can continue to improve on that. But really good question, Yim. Uh, really really appreciate it. So Drake, before we dive into his collegiate stats, this is a really good segue. <clears throat> excuse me, into that, and it's the stats Matt stat of the day. Let's so, go. Here it is. So for stats, Matt's stat of the day, his 2023 stats allowed in coverage, 62 targets, 27 receptions. So it's only a 43.5% completion percentage allowed in 2023, only allowed 290 yards all season and zero 
touchdowns. So really, really good coverage numbers from from Quinion Mitchell. And and when you if you think about adding him to that Colts defense, Drake, that just gives you another another valuable weapon on on the outside where you have Juju Brents on one side because Juju Brents, while he was healthy, definitely showed some flashes. Quinion Mitchell, he's he's another guy that that high level athlete but he's a, a guy that's really sticky in in coverage and and has experience both in off off coverage as well as press man really a lot of the stuff that the Colts like to run in Gus Bradley's scheme yeah and when you look at those stats I mean for college to get targeted only f- like less than five times a game that's that's pretty it's pretty good when you only allow 27 of those to be caught for barely over 10 yards that means he doesn't get burned or at least he didn't get burned or he was securing the tackles as soon as those short yardage catches were received so again you got it's the mid-atlantic conference my apologies so it's the it's the mac but again you look at first round guys if they're not from one of those perennial you know alabama's georgia's you look for them to dominate the field that they're in and quinion mitchell just did nothing but dominate right there the the clutch stat from stats matt third host of the show that proves it he basically got allowed two catches a game out of about five targets a game in 13 contests that's the definition of lockdown especially i love the zero touchdowns talk about responding to the red zone and responding to pressure well that means he did well away from toledo just as good as he did at home too 67 of those 290 yards were yards after catch so really didn't allow too many yards after catch either that's good. <laughs> so stats, Matt, thank you so much for uh for those for those stats, buddy. Let's take a little bit deeper, oh, yeah. Drake. 41 tackles, two tackles for loss, an interception, and 18 passes defended in 2023 for Quinion Mitchell. Uh, uh, he was a second team all American, first team all Mac, and then the Chuck Bednarik award semifinalist which is the college defensive player of the year award then going to his his total tack uh, his total stats at toledo in four seasons 123 tackles seven and a half tackles for loss six interceptions two of which were returned for touchdowns one sack 45 passes defended which is a toledo school record uh, all of that in four seasons and and here's the thing guys when we talk about Quinion Mitchell and putting up those stats at, at Toledo, probably against lesser competition. Quinion Mitchell had the opportunity to transfer and go to a, a big school. You know, he, he was w- w- wanted by the likes of Georgia, Alabama, Ohio State, the big, all the big top schools, Michigan, all those top programs wanted Quinion Mitchell. But he wanted to stay in Toledo and finish what he had started with the school he recruited him and and started where he started at. So in that you can think that's that's kind of honorable that he would want to finish what he started at that school. But it wasn't for a lack of talent that he was at Toledo. You know he could have very well gone to those other schools, just just chose not to. So, but Drake, when you look at those stats again, that just tells what up against the competition he faced, and he had, did have opportunities against bigger competition, like I said, against Marvin. Harrison Jr. I mean, he really stood out. Yeah, and you know, as something else is when you when you look at the the body of work here. Okay, like it's just been lights out, and I, I get that. You know, he didn't go to the bigger school, but it also kind of worked out pretty damn well for him, didn't it? Like just to stay at Toledo, the guy is arguably the number one corner in the draft right now. Okay, and you know something else is that the Colts love them, love them a locker room and character guy. Look no further than a guy who doesn't want to leave the MAC conference. I mean, he could have potentially skyrocketed his NFL draft uh, prospect ranking at the time by going to a bigger school, but he stayed with the Toledo Rockets, man. There's something to be said about that, okay? The opportunities were elsewhere, and he would have been able to handle himself just fine against bigger competition. Maybe you don't have some of these gaudy stats, but you're still going to have what's important. That's reliable, consistent stats, and he's probably still a first-round talent. So I, I... I don't think it really hurt him. I think it actually helped him to stick out at a, at a school like Toledo as without question, probably their best player by talent level by far. 
Oh yeah, Quinion Mitchell's easily was easily the best player at Toledo. Yeah. Now, as far as the Colts' interest so far in Quinion Mitchell, they really haven't spoken too much with Quinion Mitchell. So at his pro day, it was just Midwest scout Mike Lacey that was there. Uh, Quinion Mitchell didn't participate in the pro day. He was there. He was in attendance, but he kind of he proved all that he needed to prove at the senior bowl and, and at the NFL combine. So he, he sat on, on those performances. But when I had the chance to talk to him after the pro day, you know, and kind of ask him how the process had been going, uh, the, any interest or had, what the communication had been like as he built a relationship with the Colts. And he really said he hasn't had too much, uh, too many ch- communication with the Colts. Now that's not necessarily a bad thing, you know, just because a team doesn't, you know, talk to you doesn't necessarily mean that that they're completely out on you. Quentin Nelson, the Colts really didn't talk and have talk too much to Quentin Nelson before the draft. Same with Quiddy Pay. You know, the Colts really didn't t- talk with Quiddy Pay too much before the draft. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the Colts aren't interested in in Quinion Mitchell. It, it could mean that they really just don't have any question marks about Quinion Mitchell. You know, uh, about his game. Uh, about about different things in his background because everything we heard talking to coaches there at Toledo's pro day, you know, all the they all had glowing remarks about the kids. So, well, it doesn't add up to like the, the same attention that the Colts have put on, you know, sending in that contingent to the Texas pro day that we talked about, or sending Reggie Wayne out to like the LSU pro day or the Oregon pro day. Uh, they, they really haven't had too much contact with Mitchell, but like I said, Drake, it, it, to me that doesn't necessarily mean that he's off the Colts board or that the Colts aren't interested in him. Yeah. And this is, everyone also has to think like, this is a game of human chess. The off season is between these teams. If, if you can get a team to think, especially a divisional rival that, that you're doing something when you're really not, you should do it. You have enough scouts at your disposal to do it. Like Andrew pointed out in last year's uh, brilliantly written Notre Dame uh, Pro Day Journal, Ballard doesn't typically send a lot of scouts anywhere, okay? Don't don't think that just because Mike Lacey was there and no one else was there that they're not interested in Quinion Mitchell. Like Andrew said, it could mean a million things. It could mean that they're just like, you know what? Yeah, he's the guy. He's the guy. We, we just needed one guy. Just as much as it could be like, looking at the Texas pro day, like, holy cow, you got JBC there, the of- offensive coordinator. You've got Shane Steich and you've got Reggie Wayne. They might just be doing their diligence to say, hey, this was the fastest recorded receiver and player in NFL combine history and an incredibly reliable receiver like A.D. Mitchell. We need three eyes because there's two players. Just as much as it could be, hey, we only care about Quinion Mitchell at Toledo's pro day. Mike, we only need you to go watch because we trust you. Know There's just so many levels of this. Don't look at face value. Just like Chris Ballard said, everyone's lying. Okay, everyone's lying. You're trying to get one up on your divisional opponent, okay? You, you got to talk about the Jaguars hat just went out and got Gabe Davis. The Titans got Calvin Ridley, and, and the Texans got Stephon Diggs, okay? You're trying to get one up on your on your divisional rivals. And I think that Ballard is far more of the guy who's willing to fool you in plain sight. So I think that they, dare I say it, Andrew, I think that he's arguably at the top of their list. If they I, can get him. at the cornerback position, I would, I would say so. He's That's top, what I mean. Easily, Sorry. the easily the top three, you know? Uh, and, and again, it's 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 not it could just mean that they don't have any questions about Quinion Mitchell, whether it's his game, whether it's his personality, uh, anything like that. So if, if they feel comfortable enough, why why exp- expend those those resources when you know uh, and you're comfortable that Quinion Mitchell is is one of the top cornerbacks, you know, in this class. So uh, I, I don't think it necessarily means means too much that that they haven't gone head over heels or, or as far as uh trying to communicate with with Quinion Mitchell uh we'll, we'll just kind of have to see how it all plays out but but Drake this is this is kind of the fun part let's dive in to the strengths of Quinion Mitchell so let's dive into the tape what did we see from the tape uh I'm typically I'm typically always going first in these with the strengths and weaknesses uh Drake I'm giving it to you, bud. Let's start out with you. What are your strengths from Quinion Mitchell after watching the film and, and kind of seeing uh, what number 27 for Toledo is all about? Oh, man. Just to preface this, a lot of positives, 
Just not many negatives, man. I'm telling you. So six foot, he's six feet tall. He's about 200 pounds, but he plays bigger than that. I, I would say that he's, he's just such a physical guy that can maintain his balance. That's something else is that he's got very good balance. If he's facing a big wide receiver and he's in press coverage, he can really, really go toe to toe with that that uh, that that pass catcher. Just like if he's playing off of a guy, he's got that speed that he can keep up with just about anybody in the NFL. I mean, four point three speed is elite speed. There's just not many guys running four point twos, and guess what? Not all of them are starting in the NFL either. So I think Quinion Mitchell has elite speed. I don't think anyone's going to run away from him. If it, you know, you go back in a time portal and you put him on Nico Collins, there's a good chance that he catches up with Nico Collins. Um, I think that I just I think that it's a perfect scheme fit if we're talking about the strengths for Indianapolis. But if we're talking about strengths for Quinion Mitchell, he's a scheme fit damn near on all 32 NFL rosters. Okay. I really do think that he's got the skills to warrant that that number one cornerback uh, uh designation for the draft and to fit in multiple defensive schemes, but especially, and this isn't even biased, and Andrew will agree with me. Gus Bradley's scheme just seems perfect for Quinion Mitchell. His physical traits, his physicality. We talked about it earlier, going all the way back into the dark ages of the Legion of Boom, big physical corners. Everyone talks about Richard Sherman. Don't forget about Byron Maxwell, big physical corner that once he was out of that system, he was a shell. So I think Gus Bradley would be able to just use Quinion Mitchell so effectively, even better than his talents indicate. So I just think there's so many strengths at the end of the day, the speed, the strengths or the speed, the physical strength and the, and the technical ability are all there that a guy like Ron Milas can just mold into somebody special. Yeah, I think you're right on point there. You know, I, I think that, that when, when I turned on the tape, the, the, obviously what stands out immediately fantastic athlete can absolutely fly the, the the it shows on the tape and then the 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 combine numbers back that up with that 433 speed you know uh he he really you never saw him got beat deep uh you never saw a a, a wide receiver really really take advantage of him or as far as like create separation from him he's he's really he's really a smart instinctual player and and here's the thing too. Well, he had just six interceptions. You know, four. I think five of those came uh, last season. Only had one this past season. Mostly because guys weren't throwing Mitchell's way. Uh, but but when the ball's in the air, he has really good timing to just get get in there and disrupt the throwing lane, disrupt the pass. You know, and that's evident by having over forty passes defended in his career at Toledo. Literally now the the record holder for for passes defended at Toledo so really really just just has great timing to get his hand in there uh disrupt a wide receiver and and knock the ball away which which is huge you know uh I I've, I've seen it mentioned numerous times in the chat and you're absolutely right excels in off coverage and press man so most of the time at Toledo he did play in off coverage a lot of the time though that's what the Colts are in off coverage so um, but he has he has those again those instincts where he can play off of the wide receiver, but he never he never gets in the wrong spot. You know he never panics. Here's the thing: multiple times when I was watching Mitchell's tape, there were times where a wide receiver would would get a half a step or a step on him. But and a lot of times with with young corners, Drake, when when a when a wide receiver gets a step a half a step on them they start to panic you know they start to get grabby they 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 end up getting called for holding or, or pass interference and and the, and it it ends up really costing it. rocky sin rocky sin as a young cornerback for the colts has happened to him a lot he would play great coverage through 90 percent of the play then that final 10%, he would panic, get grabby, start holding, get called for a penalty, and it was all for naught. That doesn't happen with Quinion Mitchell. He is hardly ever penalized. Uh, I think in over 400 coverage snaps last season, I don't think he was penalized once, you know? And, and that's huge. That is huge going into the NFL because uh, in, in college, you can probably get away with, with more stuff, you know, as far as being being handsy and, and grabbing a wide receiver. At the NFL, they're, they're not gonna really going to allow you to do that. So so that's, that's a big key that I think is going to translate to the next level. Uh, and then, obviously, a ball-hawking playmaker 
forward. You know, if the ball is anywhere close to him, he's going to go for the ball. Always has his eyes on the ball. And that's something that the Colts cornerback room just doesn't have. Yes, Kenny Moore the second had three interceptions last season, but Jalen Jones had zero. Juju Brents had one. They need a guy that's able to take the football away. That was supposed to be Isaiah Rogers Sr. You know, Drake, how much did we talk about that last last offseason? You know, that Isaiah Rogers was finally going to get his opportunity and he was going to be that guy that could create some turnovers and, and really take the football away. He he's no longer here. And and because of that, the Colts really didn't don't have a ball hawking type cornerback. You bring Quinion Mitchell in, he would immediately be that ball hawking type type cornerback. He a lot of times baits quarterbacks into into throwing his way. Again, talking about that instinctual intellectual type of uh, uh, player uh, at the cornerback position, he's able to make really quick break on the ball, use that explosiveness to break on the ball, and comes away with either an interception or or a pass defense. So. So it's just the, the way he plays the cornerback position, especially in coverage, is, is really, really fun to watch. And it's something that I just don't think the Colts have on their roster, a guy that can be that lockdown in coverage. Sure, you have the big physical type of cornerback in, in Juju Brents, who, who has certainly shown that, that uh, he has the potential to be a good starter. But in terms of lockdown guy, I don't know if that's Juju Brents' game. And that's perfectly fine but I think you still need a cornerback like that. And Quinion Mitchell brings that to the table. Yeah. And um, before I get into what I was briefly going to say, I do want to highlight a couple of things in the chat and I'm going to have, it's just a few, a few comments that are right down the alley of what we're talking. I'm going to have you start at Colts house mentioned NFL elite wide receivers are a different level than what Toledo plays. Just my opinion. Absolutely. Okay. Like we said, Toledo is not playing elite level competition. All right. But two things. Number one, when he played the competition that was thrown in front of him, he wasn't just elite. He was over the top. He was instantly on the game tape out of every position, all 22 on the field. You immediately recognized Quinion Mitchell over pretty much everybody else in any Mac game. I can tell you that. Number two, he did still play Marvin Harrison Jr., and he played him absolutely fantastic. He also played against some pretty elite wide receivers during Senior Bowl week, and he mm -hmm. made them all look absolutely stupid. And in fact, it was just Michigan's Roman Wilson who caught a pass on him. That's the only pass I heard caught, and it was because Quinion slipped. Mm -hmm. Okay, so totally understand where you're coming from, Colts House, but just, just got to give him a chance because I think that there's something special there. Um what? A, oh, yeah. A, then uh, just to highlight a couple more, Rich Wheeler mentioned, given Mitchell's ascension these last few weeks, I think there's a high chance he's gone before we pick. And real, real brief here, because I know we, we are over the 30-minute mark, I got to pick your brain on this. Do you think that's true? Do you think that like by the time they pick, like for example, do you think that he's done so well that a team like the Chargers, who could use another cornerback, might be like, you know what, Quinion over Brock Bowers? I, I think it's definitely possible that Quinion Mitchell isn't there at 15. You know, I think I think Denver could be a potential spot with yep. for him. I put opposite of Pat Sertan. Um, I Raiders. think Las Vegas, exactly. Las Vegas really don't the have much AFC West outside the Chiefs <laughs> have much talent on the outside. So there's 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 definitely a few teams before the Indianapolis Colts that that could take him. They could also go different direction. You know, uh, if the Broncos end up going after a quarterback, we'll see. Uh, or do they go after a pass? rusher uh the raiders could be looking for offensive line help they could opt for terry on arnold uh the other cor other top cornerback in this class so uh there's definitely a chance that that quinion mitchell is not there at 15 it's it's not a given that he's just going to be there uh ready for ready for the taking for the colts when when they're up when they're up to pick yeah uh, uh thank you so much rich and then there's just two more so i'm going to call you Z uh, uh Z cubed because your name is so long it's very difficult to pronounce so i went with za 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 so you're za cubed only team that could pick uh oh yeah 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 um my apologies I actually there was a yeah yeah um i'm trying to find the exact comment my apologies um i cannot find the comment from Oh yeah, uh, so 
My oh yeah, yeah. So he said, uh, "I'm not a big fan of pay, honestly. If I'm Ballard, I'm trading up for Verse Turner using the 15 in pay." So the reason I brought this up is because Quinion Mitchell could be selected with the 15th pick. Look, I think that if Samson Ebicom, let's hypothetically say Samson, Samson Ebicom wasn't signed. All right, let's say they pass on him, let him go elsewhere. And they have, instead of 51 sacks and a guy who led the team with 9.5 sacks, you talk about Quiddy Pay leading the team with 8.5. And you kind of look at the tape and you realize he didn't put the most pressure on quarterbacks. You might be looking at something like that. But I think that given the fact that you haven't seen anyone else outside of Raquan Davis and Taven Bryan signed to the defensive front, and Charlie Partridge's hiring to, to coach the defensive front. I think the Colts are saying to the whole NFL world and all the fans, hey, we believe in this defensive front. We were just the right coach away. So I think that that's why you're not going to see any edge rushers selected by the Colts in round one. It, 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 to me, it'd probably be Dallas Turner, if anything. If he falls. If it's not, if Dallas Turner isn't there, there, there's not really an edge rusher at 15 that I would warrant using a, at the 15th pick. And, and, the, regardless the Colts are really happy with their their defensive line you know they really like their guys there and and are waiting to see what what pay and, and Odangbo can do in 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 this upcoming season you know in in their in their fourth year but but Drake let's talk about some of the uh uh the weaknesses you know of Quinion Mitchell obviously you know not the longest arms average length 31 inch arms it's not a killer uh, uh it's not like he has t-rex arms out there but it's not the the aggressively long arms like of a juju brents uh, uh so that's that's definitely something that could be a, a slight knock for him for the, the colts but i i don't necessarily think that, that that's gonna have too big of a of an impact and then really the the only other week though other weakness that really stood out to me on tape was that he tends to open up his hips a little bit early. So a lot of times when he's backpedaling, he might open up his hips when he doesn't necessarily need to, where he can still kind of stay square with the uh, uh, with with the wide receiver that he's covering. Now in, in college, he he was able to do that and and get away with it because his hips are so fluid, he was able to kind of get around and, and quickly adjust. However, at the next level in the NFL, there's going to be wide receivers that, that really take advantage of that. When they see him open up his hips like that, they're going to move to try to get into his blind spot. And then that's when they're going to do that damage. So that's definitely something he's going to need to work on. His technique, again, still needs some work, but he's also a young player. Okay. The, the, none of these guys are perfect players. He'll, he'll have time to work on that, but, but, at the next level if he wants to reach his his full potential that's something that he'll definitely need to work on is not opening up his hips so soon kind of trying to continue to stay square with that wide receiver until he absolutely has to open up his hips because if he opens it up too early nfl wide receivers are going to take advantage of that get in his blind spot and then he won't be able to make as many plays in coverage yeah and you know you're talking about if he does hypothetically get selected by the colts he's joining still and we've been saying this for for what seems like months still one of the youngest franchises on the entire like nfl slate and okay and and you're also talking about arguably it's going to be kenny moore is probably your cornerback one but he's he's an inside guy so your outside guys are probably going to be Quinion Mitchell, if he beats out Dallas Flowers, I think that's the guy he's got to beat because I think they're really confident in Juju Brents. But you're talking about a really young secondary. So you want him to try to hit the ground running as quickly as possible. And so you're absolutely right. You can anticipate and almost project and guess, I think is the best way to put it, routes when you're in college. You might get away with that in the NFL the first or second time. But, man, these receivers – it's just constant changing. And sometimes that can get the best of younger players. It's just like, okay, at first it's working, and then you're just starting to get opened up because the receiver you're playing against is starting to catch on to your tendencies. It's all about adjusting, and there's four quarters of football. So what worked in quarter one might not necessarily work in quarter four. So just to kind of run down what, what some of his weaknesses are on his combine profile can get in trouble by declaring his hips too soon. Exactly what Andrew just said in layman's terms. His eye balance between quarterback and route is inconsistent. That goes right back to what he just said, what Andrew just said. Sometimes he tries to anticipate things a little too early. He just needs to relax and just needs to let his physicality and his and his and his I would say his physical gifts just kind of steer the ship when he's covering and just follow the receiver. And then he will get caught behind bigger downfield targets from a positioning standpoint, 
I think that goes back to maybe his height because if he can learn to use his natural strength that put him at such a high grade with his with his bench reps, I think he could really give some receivers fits. And it might take a year for him to get adjusted, but I just think that he would be overall a very good pick for the Indianapolis Colts immediately and in the long term. All of his weaknesses, it's not something that he can't overcome or it's not exactly. something that he can't fix. Yes, his arms are a little bit a little bit shorter, but again, it's not like they're they're T-Rex arms, and it certainly doesn't show up on film that it that it causes him very many issues at all. You know, so a lot of it is is just small little things with his technique that if he he can tighten up, he's going to be a very, very good cornerback in the NFL for a long time. Now he's fit with the Indianapolis Colts, Drake. We've, we've kind of talked about this throughout the entire show tonight, but he he just provides a different type of cornerback. Yes, he's athletic. Uh, yes, he can he can jump out of the gym, but he's he's not the he's he's not the, the just a physical cornerback you know he's got that speed and again that's just something that the Colts are lacking with their their cornerback group I think Dallas Flowers has it but Dallas Flowers ceiling is not the same as as Quinion Mitchell you know Dallas Flowers can be a very serviceable corner for you and I think a lot of people slept on him last year I think a lot of people are sleeping on Dallas Flowers again this year after the torn Achilles but Quinion Mitchell has that potential to be your a lockdown corner for the Indianapolis Colts if if they end up taking him at 15. You put him opposite of Juju Brents, and, and then you probably don't have to worry about the cornerback position besides adding depth because you have Brents on one side, Mitchell on the other. You got more in the slot. That's a really solid trio at the cornerback position and you know and, and you, you you talked about it earlier in the show. The Jaguars went out and got Gabe Davis the the Tennessee Titans got Calvin Ridley. The Houston Texans just traded for Stephon Diggs. They already have Nico Collins. DeAndre Hopkins is still in this division. Christian Kirk. You're going to need cornerbacks to go out there and, and cover these guys and give these guys a, a hard time. So what's what's the easiest way to make it to the, uh, to the playoffs? Win your division. So you have to make sure you match up with your division first. And with all that firepower being added on the offensive side of the ball, you need cornerbacks. You need a secondary that's able to handle that. That's why I think Quinion Mitchell, probably as much as anybody, it fits with this Indianapolis Colts, probably just as well as anybody, I should say, in this draft class. Uh, talking about like the Brian Thomas Juniors, the Brock Bowers. Quinion Mitchell is in that tier for me as far as his fit and, and his role with the Colts what do you think I think he's a day one starter uh, I, I think that if you do get Quinion Mitchell you're committing to the fact that you want a good secondary to grow together for years to come I mean you're gonna have some young guys obviously Kenny Moore's a veteran but Juju Brents a lot of people don't talk about his year two your your look if you are defensive coordinator Gus Bradley you're looking at Juju Brents like look we, we spent a second round pick on you even though they did trade back uh, and they still got him you still want to see that production as soon as humanly possible. Okay. Like he showed some good, good stuff last season. So I think Quinion Mitchell just makes sense. I think he makes sense for the Colts. I think he makes sense for a lot of teams, but especially a team that had one of the worst secondaries in 2023. Yeah. I, yeah, I would agree. And then, so, so let's, Let's put our, our GM caps on, Drake. If you're sitting there at 15 and Quinion Mitchell is available, do you take him? Let's say let's say that, that Quinion Mitchell and Brian Thomas Jr. are both there at, uh, and available at 15. Or which one are you taking? Are you taking Quinion Mitchell or Brian Thomas Jr.? And why? I'm taking Quinion Mitchell. Um, okay. And I'm taking Quinion Mitchell because, uh, for, for, well, first off, Cooper DeGene is probably the next closest realistic fit for the Colts. And I think he's probably going to be gone before they pick in the second round. So now that could be false, but I also think that Quinion Mitchell is a better cornerback than Cooper DeGene. So I also think that this is a very deep wide receiver class. I, I really believe in, in the second, third, and fourth round wide receivers of this class. Guys like Malachi Corley, guys like Xavier Leggett, okay? Even guys like Xavier Worthy, if God forbid the Colts trade back, those guys are still Steichen guys. I still think that they are. You're you're getting a steep drop off from, from Quinion Mitchell 
to the Colts next realistic fit at corner, which is Cooper DeGene. You're getting a steep drop off. I think if you're at 15, you have Brian Thomas Jr. and you have Quinion Mitchell. I think you have to take Mitchell just because of how deep this receiver class is. You can still get a play. You can still get a playmaker in the second, third round, or potentially even deeper in the draft if you really do your scouting well. See, I, I don't think that the drop off from from Mitch, at least for my scouting, Mitch, the drop off from Mitchell to DeGene isn't isn't as isn't as huge as as what others might think. I think that, that Mitchell might be just a tier above DeGene, but I think DeGene is still a, a great player. Now, the Colts would also, if they're going to draft DeGene, they would have to do it in the first round. DeGene is not going to be available there in the second round. But if I'm sitting there at 15 and Brock Bowers is off the board, because you all know the train that the Brock Bowers to Indy, it's, it's still alive and well, and it will be until he's probably inevitably taken by the uh, the New York Jets at, at number 10 but but let's not let's not uh, crush our hearts here this evening but if you on my board I've got Mitchell ahead of Brian Thomas Jr. that's not to say that Brian Thomas Jr. isn't a good player you oh, know yeah. I I mean he is easily my wide receiver four and I think Brian Thomas Jr. is a hell of a talent but I think Quinion Mitchell's better. You know, I just think he is a better prospect and has a higher, a little bit higher ceiling than Brian Thomas Jr. Both of them are, are needs for the Indianapolis Colts because you want to get more explosive on offense. You need to continue to add talent to that secondary, especially at, at the cornerback position. And so if, if you're sitting there with both those guys on the board, I'm leaning Mitchell, you know, and I, I think Mitchell would have an instant impact on day one for the Indianapolis Colts. Again, you see you you solidify that cornerback room. And and you mentioned it. There are plenty of other wide receivers in this class that, that I think can make an impact with the Colts they, that they could go after on day two. Who knows? Maybe they even trade up in that scenario to, to try to snag Xavier Worthy if they can. Uh, but but in my opinion, if it's between Mitchell and, and Thomas, I'm going to go Mitchell and, and and get a lockdown cornerback for the Indianapolis Colts. The CFO making his first appearance of the evening. Patrick, thank you so much for your super chat, buddy. As always, Patrick asks, if you think Mitchell is even an option for the Colts at 15 and is a day one starter, do we think we won't see any cornerback free agent signings? I'll be honest, Patrick, I don't. I don't see any more free agent signings because after the re-signing of Julian Blackman, which we're going to talk about here next, the Colts only have about, they have a little bit less than $10 million in, in cap space. Now, sure, you only need about $4 million of that for uh, uh for the draft class, for the incoming draft class, I think 4.2 million or, or, or something is usually set aside for, for the incoming draft class. But if you do sign another corner, if you do sign a cornerback, it's a guy that's going to be the veteran minimum. And, and at that point, are you really going to, uh, want you want him to take snaps away from guys like Jalen Jones and then Dallas flowers. If you're getting a guy for the uh, veteran minimum, you know, I just, I don't think they're really going to have that type of impact at the cornerback position. And, and the Colts always like to keep just a little bit of cap space. So that way they can be flexible in the middle of the season. Sure. They can, extend Buckner and, and do some different things to get more, uh, get, get, get more cap space to be that flexible. But if, if I had to bet on it, I would say there's not going to be a, a cornerback signing, a cornerback free agent signing for the Indianapolis Colts. The next moves at cornerback will be in the draft. Yeah. And you know, you're looking at the top available guys remaining. Okay. Xavier Howard, guys like JC Jackson, you know, Adore Jackson, uh, Cam Sutton, which he's not coming to the Colts. Uh, Stephon Gilmore. Yeah. Look, man. No, I, I, I think as much as I would love to see Xavier Howard, you know, in a Colts uniform, because I think he still has some, some juice left in the tank. I just think that they believe in Juju Brent's second year. I think that there is an element of belief in Dallas flowers recuperation, because again, in the four games he played before he went out with that Achilles, he played pretty damn well. Okay, and he'll he'll keep up with anybody. I think this team believes in their secondary. I think that they want to build through the draft. Last year they triple dipped at the position. I think there's a chance they double dip, but I think there's a chance they double dip at receiver more than defensive back. So if they do get two wide receivers, I would assume that that means a first round selection for for Quinion Mitchell. Or if they trade back, they'll get Cooper DeGene. But I just think that if you haven't seen a free agent signing at this point, they're going to draft a cornerback. 
I, I think that I, I wouldn't surprise me if they if they honestly double dip at wide receiver and and DB in in, yeah. in the draft. You know, get eight picks from a trade back. Yeah, you, you you grab a cornerback and you grab a safety. You know, I I think both of those are, are still definitely options. But Patrick, thank you so much for the super chat, buddy. Really, really do appreciate it. And it's a really good question about what what the Colts still could potentially do uh, uh, in free agency as we're three weeks from tonight. Is the first round of the NFL draft. So so we are getting close but yeah drake quinion mitchell to the indianapolis colts i think would be a perfect match you know and it could fill the the colts biggest need of the of the whole offseason you know is adding to that cornerback room yes you want to be more explosive on offense but adding anthony richardson and jonathan taylor together i think that adds explosiveness and you can still add more guys later in this draft but if it's if brock to me if brock bowers isn't there and it's between mitchell and, and thomas you you go Quinion Mitchell. Yeah, and look, e- even if you know the naysayers are out there, your three divisional opponents that you play a total of six times that pretty much decides your playoff berth or not, they each went out and got a dynamic wide receiver for their own offense. Okay, I think that that right there, especially after the Stephon Diggs trade, I think that that just pretty much tells everyone the Colts are probably going to address cornerback if they haven't signed a free agent at this point. But the Colts did address a different area of the secondary this week. And guys, Julian Blackman is back with the Indianapolis Colts. The uh, Colts and Blackman agreed to a one-year uh, extension that is worth up to $7.7 million. Uh, the it, I think the total guarantees are it's, it's $3.2 million guaranteed. Mm. And with, with uh, incentives and, and probably playing time, if, if Blackman can stay healthy, you know, it could be worth up to $7.7 million uh, uh, for, for the year. And honestly, Drake... In my opinion, this this deal is really good for both sides. You know, starting with Julian Blackman, obviously the market wasn't what he wanted it to be. You know, uh, I think he was expecting much more after his career season, and they're really just the safety market hasn't been nearly as as robust as I think it would be. Uh, but so he comes back to the Colts, he gets a, an opportunity to for on a one year deal to to if he does make the full seven seven point seven million. I, I think our, our colleague Jake Jake Arthur wrote a piece on this on HorseshoeHuddle.com. It would be the third highest contract uh, for any uh, safety in this in this class, you know, in this free agent class this year. But if he goes out there and he earns it all, he has another really good season. Blackman then has the opportunity to hit free agency, cash in on on a second consecutive really good season, and then I think he could probably get the long term deal, whether it's with Indianapolis, whether it's somewhere else, but the long term deal that he was searching for. But and, and for the Colts, you're getting a guy back really cheap that had a career year in your defense, and in that that position switch to strong safety was really a help to him. You can probably expect another really good year out of Julian Blackman as long as he stays healthy. So in my opinion, this deal is really good for both sides. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. I think the reason his market wasn't as as robust as he anticipated is his injury history. And, uh, you, you, you know, you miss damn near an entire season. Then you have kind of a drop-off year. And then you miss the last two games due to a shoulder injury that were crucial games. I mean, who knows if they don't win the game against Houston if Julian Blackman's out there, you know? So I, I I think that the injury history really limited him, but you led the team in interceptions with only 15 games. He had career highs pretty much from tackles all the way down to fumble recoveries. He played fantastic football. So I love the fact that he's back, but I think that this is the Colts saying, prove to us you're healthy for 17 games and we'll talk. Yeah, and it also again it addresses that big need. Yes, and at the safety for position, you. you know, because without without Julian Blackman, your starters are probably Rodney Thomas the second and and Nick Cross. Both those guys are unproven. Rodney Thomas took a step back in in twenty twenty three. Nick Cross played pre, played well, I think, when he was out there, just very inconsistent, you know. And to bet on those guys plus a rookie, if you would bring one in. That's that's not helping things out, you know. So to get Julian Blackman back, it just it just takes a a a, a, a almost like a relief off your shoulders because is Blackman a, a Pro Bowl level safety? 
No, but he's a solid safety, and, and you know what you're getting with Julian Blackman, especially at that strong safety position, which is a, a, a high-level starter at the position, in my opinion, at strong safety, Drake. And now you can go into the draft, and you're not pigeonholed and taking a, a, a safety with your second-round pick uh, or your third-round pick. You know, you can kind of let the board fall. So if the Colts say they did take Quinion Mitchell at, at 15, and then at 46, you took a guy like, Malachi Corley, you know, then that opens up for the third round. Did you end up taking a guy like Cole Bishop, you know, to add to that, to that mix? So it, it definitely opens things up, but again, you know, who your starter at strong safety is going to be. And then if you want to have Nick cross and Rodney Thomas kind of battle it out for, uh, for the starter at free safety in camp, plus potentially a rookie like maybe Cole Bishop, uh, then, then I'm okay with that. You know, then, then you let, you let one of your, uh, uh, you, you kind of let whichever is the best out of that young trio of free safeties kind of let the cream rise to the, to the top. And then you're, you're fully confident in what Julian Blackman could do as the free safety and, and that communicator in the back end of your defense. Yeah. And you know, look, you've got your, you've got your strong safety solidified. Okay. He's not going anywhere after a career season, after a position switch. Okay. So I really think the Colts are probably going to go with Nick cross. I think they're probably going to give him competition through the draft and then they're going to throw Daniel Scott in there as well. And they're going to say, Hey, you know what? Daniel you Scott, offer us? Yeah. Cause people forgot about Daniel Scott, great special teams ace, but he has some serious, serious athletic ability. So safety is a position to really watch during the draft. I know we're talking about round one, which me and Andrew will be covering, but there's a chance that it's Quinion Mitchell. There's a chance it's a trade back, but I'm telling you, safety, that's a position to watch for the Colts because I just – I cannot see them exiting this draft without taking one. And there's not really a, a safety that you would consider a round one prospect anyway. Nope. You know, the the where the safeties are going to be taken, the top level safeties in this draft are going to be on day two. You know, talking about you know Jaden Hicks, which I know is is a is a draft crush of stats, Matt. But Jaden Hicks, the 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 Cole Bishops, uh, the Javon Bullard, uh, the Caden Bullock. Uh, so so those those kind of uh, safeties are going to be available there on on day two, and the Colts are going to be able to to kind of see which one they they like best and and which one fits them. But yeah, Drake, I mean, again, it just it just doesn't pigeonhole you into having to take a safety. Do I expect the Colts to still take a safety? Yes. But without Julian Blackman, it just does not seem like it, you, would, you would go into the draft really concerned about that safety group. With Julian Blackman back, that's not nearly the case. So again, good contract for, for both sides. I think if Julian Blackman goes out and balls like he did last season, he's going to earn a good chunk of, of money for that extension. Drake, when I, at my opinion, he, his average annual value before free agency, I thought it was going to be around six and a half million or so. So it's a good deal for Blackman. The Colts get their best safety back and, and Hey, you revisit this after the 2024 season and, and for both of their sakes, you hope Julian Blackman goes out and balls out in, in 2024. Yeah. And based off of 2023, as long as he stays healthy, there's really no indication that he's not going to ball out. So I think that you're getting him at a discount. If that happens, it's just safe for both sides. I think that it really helps Julian Blackman's appeal to the rest of the league. If he doesn't work out for the Colts, but then it also gives Indianapolis a chance to have that safety at strong safety for the 2024 season so that you can solidify it and hey you know what if he actually does pan out well then he can stay with you long term and earn that real contract that he's probably looking for and you know if the colts end up taking quinion mitchell there at number 15 uh you're you're looking at a much different and secondary than you are currently on on april 4th <laughs> and colts fans probably have a much better outlook on this secondary heading into the 2024 season uh than they did uh here at the beginning of the month so that's our show for you guys today really fun episode dive into Quinion Mitchell, who, in my opinion, is is probably one of the top three uh, options for the Indianapolis Colts at number fifteen. Uh, so. Who knows? Maybe, maybe here in three weeks we are we're going to be live here on Horseshoe Huddle uh, on the Horseshoe Huddle YouTube channel, uh, covering the first round of the NFL Draft live with you guys. So 
maybe we're talking about the Colts taking Quinion Mitchell three weeks from tonight. But if you haven't done so, please go follow us on all of our socials, like Horseshoe Huddle on Facebook, follow at Colts on FN on X, and subscribe to the Horseshoe Huddle YouTube channel. Hit that bell so you know when Drake and I are going live every Monday and Thursday night so you never miss an episode. And if you can't catch us live or on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever you miss, uh, listen to podcasts, we're on there as well. So make sure you subscribe. Give us a five-star review so we can reach other Colts fans just like you. And Patrick with another super chat, kind of answering, coming out with the uh, the question that I just uh, uh, just answered. What are you guys doing for the draft, streaming during or watching McAfee and streaming after the Colts picks? We're going to be streaming the entire first round of the NFL draft live here on the Horseshoe Huddle YouTube channel. We'll start just before the draft kicks off, and we're going through all 32 picks. So round 15, if you want to see our live reaction or live analysis to whoever the Colts pick, pick in the first round make sure you know you can flip back and forth you can have mcafee's show on on one device you can have us on another you device have have the nfl draft on your on your tv but make sure you're tuning in you're tuning in with us and, and patrick is asking what about day two and and three day two guys gonna have you tune into the bleacher report app because uh i am representing horseshoe huddle uh in the on the bleacher report app through the entire second and third round thank you drake uh of that night and it's going to be an afc south round table so i'm representing course you huddle representing the indianapolis colts uh, and i'm going to be with with content creators for the tennessee titans the jacksonville jaguars and the houston texans we're uh, we and we are going to live stream from the bleach report app all of night two so all of round we gotta two. be andrew's armor okay oh, yeah there's gonna be some show some, up some fire in that chat so so uh it's gonna be it's gonna be a fun time though breaking down those picks uh from each of the afc south teams uh so it's it's gonna be it's gonna be a lot of fun so make sure you turn to you tune in to the bleach report app on uh night two of the draft on friday and then guys day three of the draft that's that's just a a, a crazy that's just craziness so so drake and i will be probably writing all day for yeah. horseshoehuddle.com as the picks roll in so uh, we won't be live but we will uh, break down all the rest of the picks uh, after the draft is concluded on that next monday night and as patrick the cfo says you got to listen to patrick here you got to go pick up that draft guide so make sure you guys go pick up the indie draft guide it is releasing next week uh so make sure you get in you can still have time to pre-order the 2024 edition of the indie draft guide over 225 prospect write-ups with their fits with the colts player comps special features like build a ballard uh, i've got a feature in there uh, as well so make sure you pick that up use the code in our, use the link in our description with the code draft miss get you a dollar off uh so you'll want to make sure you have that on hand throughout the entire 2024 nfl draft uh so drake i know the people uh have been talking about horseshoehuddle.com and and all the things that you've been writing been putting out some fantastic stuff tell the people what they need to go check out yeah so my uh the two pieces that are most intriguing at least in my opinion that i wrote are the three ways the colts must respond after the stefan Diggs trade to the Texans and then the Indianapolis Colts three impactful draft day situations that might go down which basically translates to dark horse situations where they might pick somebody in round one or do something in round one that many people aren't talking about so go check those out make sure to give those a read myself put a piece out today on horseshoe huddle about using the uh, relative athletic score the raz system that we've been talking about all throughout the draft prospect and how it's very useful in predicting who the colts are going to pick and who the colts have their eye on throughout this whole draft process so from the beginning of chris ballard's tenure to today i break down all of the draft picks and their raz scores so make sure to check that out as well as all the other fantastic writings on horseshoe huddle huddle.com go follow drake at d walster drake you can follow me at andrew moore nfl and we'll be back monday night to break down you guessed it cooper DeGene. cooper DeGene is having his workout for nfl teams on monday so it's very fitting that on monday we'll break down cooper DeGene as well so make sure to tune in because he very well could be uh the first round pick of the indianapolis colts as well make sure you join us on monday night enjoy your guys this weekend and we'll see you right back here on the horseshoe huddle podcast